Um, interested in this next one. This is the one that we, uh, when we saw the, the uh, CFP come in, um, David had uh, uh, really piqued our interest and I wanted to kind of frame it up a little bit. I love the variety of different kinds of, of presentations we have. Some of them, like uh, like with Mary, is very applied, very direct, showing how the knowledge that we get from understanding the inner workings of a tool turn into things that we can use for retrospective hunting. And then sometimes we've got to look toward the future. What's what's the next wave of what this kind of our, our industry is going to do? The concept of threat hunting is going to need. Um, and of course, a lot of that goes into the really big scientific kind of uh, concepts that, you know, haven't necessarily been commoditized down into a nice consumable package that we can deploy out on our networks or in our environments. Well, that's what we're looking at. We're looking out toward the future. And certainly machine learning is, is a term that gets used very often, sometimes very loosely. But we want to make sure that we understand what it does, in many cases what it doesn't, and understand how we're going to make it actionable, make it usable in our environments. And David comes to us from Cisco where that's part of what he does in, in his job is building out these really big nebulous concepts like machine learning and making them more actionable. And he's gonna specifically be looking at some statistical modeling of combining machine learning and regular expressions. So kind of something you're maybe a little bit more familiar with on the regex side, maybe introducing another layer on it with the machine learning portion as well. So without any further delay, it's uh, I'm very excited to introduce David Rodriguez. And with that, please drop some knowledge bombs for us because I'm super excited for uh, for this one. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Phil. Um, I really cannot tell you guys how much of a pleasure it is to be here. Uh, I, this is going to be a tough act to follow. Mary was an amazing speaker. And uh, if you didn't know anything about Win SCP, uh, I'm sure she's piqued your interest. So as Phil was saying, I'm going to try to push the boundaries today a little bit with what I have been kind of working with for the, like the last few months, uh, working with rule engines and why we started to build something in-house so that we could, in the future, start to deploy some statistical models that we found useful uh, in other systems. So, um, so uh, again, my name is David Rodriguez. I'm a tech lead at uh, Cisco Umbrella. So, and um, for about the last five years, I've been working with DNS data, trying to mine that data and those logs to identify various threats, such as malvertising, phishing attacks, botnets, <clears throat> uh, DNS exfiltration, and things like that. So the title of my talk is Machine Learning Meeting Regex Rule Engine. And basically, if you don't get anything from this talk, I just want one thing <laughs> other than this, is just that I'm trying to push the boundaries of rule engines and maybe some of the tools that you might be using already currently, such as Yara, Snort, Suricata, and all these other frameworks that allow you to essentially assemble various logic patterns and apply them on input data sets. Whether these be various network logs from proxy networks, firewall, or DNS logs. So maybe I can tell you a little bit about my experience <clears throat> and hopefully it relates to something that you've been doing. So I think of my day to day is actually threat hunting. <clears throat> but rather than looking at one single organization, I'm usually looking at tons of organizations or unique users across the internet. Usually at, D at Cisco Umbrella, we're resolving anywhere from billions of DNS requests at any given day. And I'm trying to understand the entities that are associated with malicious threat, like malicious actors on the internet. There's not bulletproof hosting infrastructures, or maybe someone within a network is trying to exfiltrate data using DNS tunneling. And on the other hand, I'm, I'm trying to, besides look at these topological relationships and assign them, identify those regions that are um, uh, neighborhoods that are malicious, uh, I'm also thinking about the behavioral attributes of these entities on the internet, whether or not there's sort of uh, anomalies in the requests that are being made from certain machines to certain internet resources, or maybe domain names on the internet that start to see various spikes in, in their the requested traffic to them. And so hopefully this, this, while my world is thinking about DNS traffic, in the end, I'm usually just thinking about logs. I'm thinking about taking some log line, in this case, DNS logs, and trying to apply some model to identify some sort of risk associated with it. Perhaps it's, I'm trying to identify domains that are associated with phishing. In this case, I'm usually taking one single log line and trying to apply some model in the most simplest form and identifying. <clears throat> 
usually the goal is to keep these models fairly simple and, and easy to deploy. There's usually tons of infrastructure that's behind the scenes in place. There's lots of input data sets, and there's lots of ways to actually export these domains so that there's actually enforcement with our different products at Cisco Umbrella. But usually everything hits the fan the minute a customer complains about something. <clears throat> and I find myself, and maybe you find yourself, going back to the drawing board. You rethink these, uh, these statistical models that you've been working on that you thought were so elegant and free in their simplicity and their ability to explain the various data sets that you had previously curated and, and trained them on. But you realize that maybe you forgot something about those logs, those individual log lines. Maybe there was something about a timestamp that you sort of were just forgetting. So you need to start filtering on that. Maybe there's something about the clients and the certain organizations that you're focusing on where your model only applies specifically for those use cases and so on. And so as your model starts to get more complicated or I've had experience with this uh, is that the, the deployment itself also just starts to multiply in its complexity. And so that becomes a problem to maintain. And so on the one hand, these statistical models um, or the data scientists are really pushing the limit there becomes this problem where they're either hard to deploy or these models are just too generic where in the lab they're great, but in reality, they just basically throw tons of FPs and they cause a real problem for our support teams. So to kind of counter that, there's these rule engines where they kind of help kind of refine the scope of what you want to be looking at things. <clears throat> and Usually in my mind, I think of a rule engine in a couple different ways. I think of it as just either a configuration file and then a compiler that takes this configuration file and then applies this or essentially compiles this configuration file so that it can be applied like a statistical model on some input data set so that, such that there's a result or a rule that's outputted. In this case, I'm looking at a specific, we can look at a specific example. Here is an example configuration file or rule by, that, is, that can be written in the YAR language it's usually made up of three different parts, <clears throat> but really the most interesting part is actually the last. Um, in this case, it's the, what's known as a condition in Yara. And what this says is that if the existence of any of these parts, A, B, or C exist, then this rule will be evaluated to true, sort of like an, a Boolean expression. And <clears throat> what is kind of interesting in that is that when you start to think about how what a configuration file of a rule is. It's just taking input data set. In this case, Yara is highly specific towards data sets that are related to binaries or input files. Um, it then is gonna output some sort of score. And in a way that's very similar to the way statistical models where, where I was previously explaining kind of has a similar abstraction. But as you start to work with these tools and these rules, <clears throat> you start to realize that there's kind of like this problem where you start to kind of focus on these very specific attributes. For example, that previous Yara rule was just looking for various string patterns literally in a file. And in and of itself, that might be true that that's really gonna be helping enforce and support some sort of uh, known malicious event. It might not generalize to something in the future. And so you have this, at, this tendency to start to kind of hyper-focus on potentially random noise. And in statistical modeling, they call that overfitting. So there seems to be this trade-off. You have the data scientists or these like, or that if you put on a data scientist hat, you're kind of working with these models that seem to be a little bit generic <clears throat> and they seem to generalize pretty well. But on the other hand, you have these rules that are highly specific. And currently the way that it feels is that you're on this like lower left-hand curve where there's just this huge trade-off where you're either focusing on these models or you're focusing on these rules. And in this talk, I want to just try to push this curve to the upper right-hand corner. I want to just say that when you're trying to work on rules, actually, you don't have to die, like, think of this as two different worlds. You can just think of this as like you're pushing the limits of the rule engine to get you closer to models that are going to be more generic and help you simplify your workflows in the future. OK, so this brings us to kind of like the heart of this problem, at least as I kind of I hope to kind of convey new information to you. So I will talk about now in this part, kind of like how to build your own sort of rule engine using regular expressions. <clears throat> to do that, we're gonna to need to be able to talk about how you can take something like that Yara rule, a configuration file, and an, and an expression that it is essentially like um, declaring the logical sequence of operations you want applied on some sort of input, and then producing some sort of score at the end. 
So to be able to do that, I'm going to focus on why we at, at Umbrella, why we decided to build our own model uh, or rule engine rather than use some of the pre-existing tools. On the one case, we knew that we wanted to focus on domain names only. We actually wanted to simply just apply simple regular expressions across domain names themselves. <clears throat> At the same time, we also need to do this across millions. And so we needed something that is very fast and efficient to applying various uh, combinations of regular expressions over these domain names. And none of the previous like rule engines sort of had that, were kind of focused on that area. So if you're not familiar with domain names, uh, this is sort of an example on cisco.com. <clears throat> and as you think about domain names and we're, as we're trying to exploit the different lexical characteristics of these domain names, DNS is very specific in that it has a very specific hierarchy where these, dot, um, these symbols of the dot essentially demarcate various parts of the domain name for various routing purposes, usually starting at the prefix. On this case, it's starting with the com which is helping route down something across a pay level domain called Cisco. And the subdomain itself is then something that which the owner of the pay level domain can then control. Now in the domain name, as I'm trying to I kind of push you towards thinking about this problem of what can you do with domain names, uh, I'm just trying to meet in this slide, just kind of show you there's these different ways of writing regexes to capture different parts, parts of a domain name. In this case, you start to use a lot of anchoring with your regexes to identify different parts. <clears throat> in this case, for example, you can anchor toward the end and you can get the TLD for the com, and you can also anchor on the lower, on the beginning parts of the string and capture subdomain characteristics. Okay, so here's the first rule that um, within our configuration files, this is how you express it, <clears throat> a certain rule that will be applied on a domain name. In this example, maybe I'll just pause for a second and like kind of let you try to digest, digest what's kind of being expressed here. There's a two, there's three sections kind of as previously in the YAR rule. There's a meta meta section. It's kind of just information that's just kind of generic that will be used for different uh, monitoring um, and um, uh, enforcement later uh, with some uh, other parts of this uh, rule engine that we don't really need to talk about right now. And then there's kind of the heart of this problem where it's essentially the definition of the patterns of rules or in this case, regular expressions that will be applied on domain names and then how those, ex those patterns will then be combined in what's, what we're call we call an expression. So as I've kind of paused and kind of just explained this a little bit, maybe in English, here's what I see when I'm looking at this. This rule is essentially looking for domains that don't have subdomains that end with the TLD site and that have the pay level domain starting with the characteristics my-apple. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so kind of re rethinking that expression, um, so sorry, let me just go back and kind of show this. So the TLD and domain is the expression which I wanna now focus on. I wanna kind of use that as a, as a stepping stone to helping you think about how do you actually build your own rule engine. And basically what you need to do is work backwards from where you're essentially trying to end. So in this case, we want to evaluate this expression. And so to get there, we need to rethink how that looks. So graphically, we can rewrite this regular expression in a binary tree. Essentially, the leaf nodes are the regular expressions themselves. <clears throat> uh, there on the one hand, on the left-hand node is the TLD regular expression. On the right-hand side is the domain regular expression. These are then evaluated across the domain name. In this instance, does the domain name have the site TLD? In this other instance, does the, does the domain actually not have a subdomain and does it start with my-apple? Once evaluated, for example, these would evaluate to numbers, maybe zero or one, Boolean indicators <clears throat> describing whether or not the, the pattern matched. Now, once you have these leaf nodes with, that contain these integers, you have this root node that can, is essentially the operator that defines how you combine the information that's contained in the, the leaf nodes. In this case, it's a logical operator, which we want to use as an AND operator. If you write <clears throat> a truth table for this, so for example, if the evaluation of the left-hand node was one and the right-hand one was a zero, it's evaluated, would evaluate to zero. On the other hand, or false, 
and then if the left hand node was a one and the right hand node was a one, this would evaluate to a true. Now, that was one single operator. Now imagine you can have lots of different operators. You can have these logical operators such as and or 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 greater than or less than. You can imagine numbers, Boolean indicators on the leaf nodes indicating yes or no. <clears throat> And then you can also now imagine, since you these in the leaf nodes, you can think of integers being down there. You can think about actually arithmetic operators. You can think about doing addition on these numbers. You can think about subtraction, multiplication. And now that's essentially the aha moment. That's the minute when, uh, like I started, when I started thinking about this problem, what was at the heart of these rule engines is just the ability to combine these integers and arithmetic expressions that essentially are the building blocks for larger expressions that are more complicated. <clears throat> and so, for example, when you start combining, what is, when I think about most machine learning models or at least statistical models, you start to think of them as actually lots of different variations of very simple um, operations in algebra. It's usually either simply addition and multiplication, or it might be matrix multiplication and addition and so, hence, there might be all these custom operators you could think of, kind of envision, where if you have information in leaf nodes, <clears throat> you can combine them using various operators. In this case, some of, some of the few that you might be thinking of, I might be familiar with, is such as the dot product of two vectors. You might think of the, a, what's known as a hat of matter pro product, or what otherwise called the pointwise product of two vectors. Or you might be thinking, actually, uh, even beyond the scope of, of those simple, just arithmetic or uh, matrix algebra, you could be thinking about linear model operator, where if you think about what is the guts of a linear model, it's, a, it's the coefficients of the model and it's an input and they're dotted together. <clears throat> Same with a GLM. Typically, this is the dot product of input coefficients with an input, or sorry, with coefficients with an input that are then exponentiated and so on. Okay, so what's really interesting that I would just want to kind of reiterate here is that with, given these kind of expressions that you can, or an expression that can be written in a binary tree, you want to think about, you can think about these root or these leaf nodes containing not just zeros or ones, but also on any integers, for example, one, two, three, four, five. In that case, with a, using simple regular expressions, what I'm talking about is just the difference between doing a simple pattern match versus a find all match on a regex. In this case, you might be counting the number of matches of a pattern. And one of the simple, or like one thing you might be wondering is, well, if you're in, if one kind of caveat here is like, as you start to eva evaluate leaf nodes at different values other than Boolean values, such as zero and one, the question becomes, how do logical operators continue to work? Um, in that case, this is just a simple slide. I don't, maybe won't go into all the details here, but it's simple to, or I just want to express that you can kind of rethink what our logical operators are <clears throat> within the framework of having actual integer counts such that they, they actually still evaluate as you would expect them to. So as the lower um, example is showing you how you can actually kind of combine um, these kind of counts uh, in logical operators such that like you, you get what you would expect. Okay, so now that I've kind of described a little bit of how, like in my mind, what is at the heart of a rule engine? It's essentially a compiler that takes a configuration file and then expresses it typically in some sort of logical sequence so that the operations which you as an analyst want performed on it. The next thing is being able to just actually build that expression or that abstraction, or in this case, a binary tree. So the simplest way of doing that is actually taking your simple expression that you wrote as a human in human readable format and putting that into more computerable computer readable format. In this case, we want to take an infix expression and rewrite it as a postfix expression. On the right hand side is the postfix expression. Uh, that's kind of it's it's basically is sort of a way of traversing um, this string such that when you finally reach an operator, you then sort of have a rule that essentially performs the arithmetic in the way that you would do it in the same way that you would do with inline. <clears throat> so the big, or 
maybe one thing that I want to just kind of caveat here is just like, what's really fun about this part of the problem of being able to just literally parse uh, something that someone would write, you know, kind of logically in these rule engines and then kind of abstracting them into this postfix expression is that this is sort of one of those places where it actually allows you as if you were the author of these rule engine, you could actually in, implement really nice, like sim, uh, kind of like uh, syntactic sugar, I guess sometimes you may call it, where it makes things sort of simpler for the user. So you can kind of put shorthand. So maybe there's like a, a special for like, um, um, uh, the, is they use a certain character that's sort of reserved that you don't let users use. So for example, if you use the letter E, it might be a shorthand notation for the number 2.718 literally the abbreviation of the uh, natural number E. So <clears throat> there's lots of things you can kind of do in this kind of area that help kind of like simplify the workflow of like, let's say when you're building these rules um, in just which I'll show you in just a little bit. So the, what is the big deal with this like infix to postfix? The idea is that it just simplifies everything. Like literally, we're essentially almost done with this problem. We almost have a completely constructed a rule engine from scratch because at this point, now all we need to do is simply iterate through this postfix expression and then using a stack, we can just pop, we can then push things, we can iterate through the postfix expression, push each of the individual elements onto the stack. Then each time you reach an operator in this postfix expression, you start popping off the elements <clears throat> in the stack, and then you essentially construct your binary tree, for example. Okay, so like I was saying, so that is pretty much the heart of everything, at least in my mind, and at least <clears throat> when we implemented our version, it really ended up just being one line, or sorry, one file of Go laying code that contained essentially all of the logic that you, you just saw in the previous slide. Essentially, just to rephrase it, we have a configuration file, which is parsed. We have an expression that is then rewritten into a binary tree. And then we have essentially regular expressions that are applied <clears throat> at the leaf nodes on domain names. So here's a few examples. What do you like, why, why do all of this? And so here's kind of like what a few different ways that you can rethink using your rules, uh, your rule engines <clears throat> so that you can enable these kind of slightly more nuanced ways of thinking about rules and writing rules. Here's an example of simply lit embedding in the precondition that a domain name has lots of digits compared to the alphabetical characters in the domain. In this case, it's more than 25%. <clears throat> At the same time, you can kind of whittle down the space of domains that you want to be looking at, for example, to those domains that with the, with the TLD ICU. Here's another example where you can express things now as literally a linear combination of the evaluation of regexes <clears throat> such that you actually have a linear model, but then you have a cutoff point where if this evaluates to some number greater than say 0.5, then you have a classification of a domain as meet, meeting some criteria maybe that it's phishing versus not. And maybe I can just pause here um, to kind of just mention that with these linear models, this is totally not theoretical. This is actually something which on our team we've been actually experimenting with a lot. <clears throat> and for a long, for you know, over like the last probably three years, we've been experimenting with lots of different deep learning techniques to tease out character, character combinations across domain names that we think are, can kind of predict malicious domain names. And so this kind of hyper focus on very specific keywords and their linear combinations to identify phishing domains, we've actually found it to be quite successful. <clears throat> so, so then kind of like kind of push this just a little bit further so that you're kind of just aware of it is that you can kind of also kind of use the different operations in uh, that kind of were previously kind of shown and that you can so that you can exponentiate these linear combinations and you can uh, achieve a generalized linear model. Okay, so now that I've kind of given a few different examples, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I've, uh, I'm now kind of going to just kind of walk you through some of the um, some of the ways that we kind of just took steps towards putting out this final uh, rule engine. Uh, what were the, actually the simplest steps we took 
um, it wasn't at, at all, I would say, admittedly, uh, building out these statistical models to start. And that's what I kind of want to discuss now. And then where we're at now is kind of working on uh, the, the statistical models. Sorry, I'm uh, looking at uh, the, the, the uh, Slack chat and uh, someone is uh, playing around with um, some tricks. So that's awesome. <laughs> okay. So I work on a fairly small team, at least currently. Um, and so the question was, how could we really tackle a problem that was actually quite big that was brought to us? Um, so management came to us asking if whether or not we could improve the efficacy towards phishing attacks, which they recently saw a major uptick to our enterprise customers. This was pretty much across the board in the US and in Europe. <clears throat> and now the, the problem there was we were gonna be really held accountable for this. So um, our team started really really brainstorming what was the best thing we could do with the limited resources we had. And maybe you found yourself, you found yourself doing similar things. On the one hand, kind of I've alluded to, we actually have, have had some previous work working with some deep learning models or even scikit-learn models that identify dom phishing domains based on just the keywords that are used within a domain name. We started ranking those and how much time it would take for us to do that and then how much coverage it would actually um, provide us and essentially reduce the customer complaints we were actually getting or what we called internally false negatives. We also had kind of debates and conversations and pr proof of concepts of the efficacy of us focusing on very specific uh, bulletproof hosters and their, their, ten tendency, their tendency to be using phishing uh, as a very uh, prominent uh, theme in their attacks. Similarly, we were looking at different uh, ways of looking at actually just the HTML content of uh, phishing pages. So one, on, for one, one example was actually just taking screenshots of phishing pages and applying a convolutional neural network on the, 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 the image and, I did, and just labeling it uh, as a login page or not. And then we had a whole series of, um, based on the the reports from our customers and the phishing attacks that they were seeing recently, there were a bunch of simple ideas that we had that we could potentially put together really quickly uh, in terms of regexes over across a series of different brands and different keyword combinations that we typically did never saw uh, in uh, domains. And so we ended up kind of slowly taking steps out of this hole that it felt like we were in. Uh, and some of the, here's just three of the approaches that we started go, walking through and we started working on and I'll try to allude to different highlights and like some pain points that we had with these. The first was keyword neighborhoods. In this example, you're looking at a domain name with a keyword Apple uh, and then some neighborhood of characters uh, that are associated with this known phishing domain. That's the, um, so it starts with the Apple, and the ID dash check is set of the neighborhood. <clears throat> we then configured like wrote scripts to take a series of or thousands of domains that were known to be phishing and applied uh, a filter over various brands that we wanted to be looking for, known brands, and then we would try to extract and sort of uh, um, sort of uh, walk through these strings and sort of like open, kind of include new characters that we thought might be sufficient to identify uh, various uh, anomalous sort of key like character combinations with known brands. So in this case, like that's sort of bizarre that the Apple ID dash check just happens at all. Uh, in, for example, that in like our traffic, we maybe have never seen that before. <clears throat> and like I was saying that we did this for tons of brands. There was, we, we have a very large user base. And so there's, we needed ways to automate this. There were thousands of brands that we were trying to kind of provide some minimal coverage for and identifying uh, various phishing domains. <clears throat> and this was just kind of a slide to kind of allude to some of the challenges of trying to like work with lots of different domain or brands. And you'll find yourself working through, especially restricting yourself to regexes. And here's a slide of just kind of showing like, so what we started doing is we started working internally. We have lots of feeds internally. Um, you might be familiar with Fish Tank. Um, that's a product that was started up in DNS, which is the predecessor to Cisco Umbrella. And, um, but uh, at the same time, we needed to kind of expand our, our reach. And we, so we started using a lot of open source uh, uh, domains that were kind of being uh, identified as IOCs. And so um, this is just an example where it's actually becomes fairly non-trivial to automate this uh, concept of like the neighborhoods of to brands. 
for example, you'll start to see that brands start to appear as subdomains or the actual like brand domain name itself appears in the domain, but there's very few characters that you can kind of leverage in terms of the neighborhoods to kind of identify that. And so you needed to, so we, we really had to like kind of surgically get into these scripts and kind of automate the way in which like finding the, not only finding the brands, finding the placement of the brands within the domain names, making sure that the then outputted regexes that were trying to identify the brands would have certain anchor points, counts of digits and things like that. Another approach we took was actually just trying to rethink how our attackers attacking us. And so we started brute forcing actually a ton of our brand, finding the brands that we wanted to focus on and starting to permute the different uh, domain names so that uh, we actually kind of preemptively thought about that some of the various typo squats that actually people are using. Here's an example of kind of one of the effective, uh, one of the more effective uh, permutations that we have found is just a simple alliteration of Instagram using an L instead of an I. And what I thought, like about this example is not only like this was just something that was not at all on our radar, but it became just a very prominent kind of um, once we became aware of it, we realized that the prominence of this online at the moment is just how often people are being fished um, at Instagram for essentially copyright infringement, basically scaring people to think that like they've just posted a, or reposted a picture that someone's trying to sue them for now. And I like this because these domain, the one domain on, on the left is actually a permutation of Instagram and on the right, you kind of see this nice kind of neighborhood of characters that maybe previously we would have never known Instagram was kind of like if it if we saw those characters kind of or those substrings kind of in combination with Instagram, then we would now kind of start to think that they're going to be malicious. <clears throat> also, like one of the things that we also started doing was actually rethinking how um, you you take a series of domains. So what, what we were working with like was millions of domains a day that we're trying to process and trying to kind of identify these phishing attacks. <clears throat> but at the same time, we have a huge treasure trove of known hi historical uh, phishing domains. And on the one hand, some of these attacker or like these actors uh, are kind of reusing their infrastructure, reusing scripts. And they're essentially just like, you know, permuting different like keywords, maybe just appending various um, digits in, in those domains. This is an example where some of, some of the times they're literally just getting lazy and they just, they just use variations of digits. This is a pretty easy uh, catch with a regex. <clears throat> but what I want to kind of highlight with this is just like actually how you can kind of work this backwards in the other direction, just like actually you can use some of these other techniques in the other direction, which is not that you want to identify malicious domains, but you actually want to identify benign domains. So for example, if you set up a, you, if you've ever set up um, some sort of script to uh, monitor all the domains that are going in and out of a network and you start to like lay in a few different keywords and you start to notice that you know you get these false positives at the same time you can also start to use these regexes to actually filter out things that you know are actually okay um, these are usually automated services <clears throat> domains that are used in apis that are just kind of transferring various data back and forth and a lot of those domains are actually algorithmically generated and, and actually quite predictable in nature in the future. And so they're usually using very specific types of character combinations or a prepending of digits. And this is one of those examples that we kind of use to leverage that. Okay, so I just described uh, pretty quickly just a few examples of how we actually kind of bootstrapped out our, our phishing detection using this sort of rule engine that I kind of described previously. So you can imagine a lot of those regexes or just essentially the regexes that kind of you saw on the, the slides just there, but then maybe with a few little checks, maybe we only let those rules or those patterns go out if the TLDs were um, being cheaply, uh, you could buy them for cheap on at GoDaddy, or we only let that rule out if they're cheap by registration at RegRU, which is like a, a, a Russian hoster. Um, another popular thing that we would use is something like identifying actually free, uh, free uh, country code TLDs, and things like that. <clears throat> but now that I've kind of described that, I want to talk about like how we actually kind of went forward to kind of and have now kind of systematically started to build like uh, like a routine around using this framework so that we can actually um, deploy things to production. 
So we started with a CLI tool so that we could rapidly prototype things. We wanted to be able to take in millions of domain names on, and try a really simple rule really quickly and just get feedback literally within a minute. <clears throat> And we, so we built, so as I've kind of been alluding to, we built this, we built our rule engine in Go uh, simply for performance that we could actually do that so that we could test millions of domain names um, at, with a ton of different regex combinations. With a simple, uh, simple performance metric on that is that we could easily take thousands of um, these patterns, very basic patterns, and apply them on millions of domains names and get like a result within minutes or less than a couple minutes at the very worst. Um, but what I'm highlighting here is the performance related to this regex rule engine with respect to linear, like kind of more complicated expressions that are kind of like linear models. So what you see here, basically the takeaway is that in testing in the CLI tool, you could build about 100 linear models and apply it on 1.8 million domains. And then it'll take you just a little over two minutes to evaluate. So now that we had a CLI tool to do things locally, we needed to be able to actually test on larger periods of time. So what we needed to do was actually replay essentially all the domains that were newly seen over the last 30 days or, or the last 90 days and try to test the efficacy of a rule to see if this thing actually was going to be good enough to go out to public <clears throat> and enforce things um, at first query. So um, to do that, we used, since we have a small team, we really don't have the resources to maintain servers that are like going to potentially go down and all the and all the maintenance that's due with that. So we use a lot of serverless uh, in, uh, infrastructure in AWS. Here's an example of how we use a CLI tool that's written in Golang to call out to um, what's known as an SNS notification in AWS. This essentially is just kind of like a message that gets routed to a few different, um, what are known as lambdas in AWS that kind of say, hey, uh, there's a request, someone wants to test this rule over this time period of all the additions of newly seen domains within the umbrella um, resolver fleet over this time period. And then maybe shovels in, you know, up to like hundred a million domains and then kind of just shovels it down to uh, one, one little worker that essentially is the CLI tool, but essentially broke up the work that's now hitting that little worker. And so the worker kind of distributes the work and only has to work on a portion of that long, like the, the million potentially domains that it has to uh, apply the regexes on. And the, the rules. And then once it's done, kind of like the output is just pushed to an S3 bucket um, so that the, um, the user uh, can just download uh, the detections that are resulting. And then the last uh, kind of way that we kind of think about uh, maybe just describing is uh, the, how, do, how do we work with this type of, how do we work with this framework and uh, to get to things out into production? We've decided to kind of work and commit to having a production rule branch which is essentially, that's what our customers are seeing. Uh, whenever someone works on an experiment uh, and adding a new rule, they'll branch off of that master branch. They'll create their, their kind of like to perform their experiments, they'll run their back tests, and then um, they'll create a PR request when they think it's good enough uh, to be merged into master. This will then trigger a review process that's reviewed internally on our team. Each member will then have to approve this pull request. And then uh, this also triggers an analyst review where there's a bunch of automated scripts that happen to go and essentially take, um, you know, what is the proposed kind of efficacy of the, <clears throat> the rule, and then kind of does some checking and validation on the domains from the pre-existing catches that it would have caught over the, a historical time period in the back test. This is usually uh, results in screenshots of the uh, domains that would have been flagged to see if these were actually known to be actually fine or not, uh, or non-phishing pages. Uh, and then once the review is kind of completed with it and approved of by, by our team and the analyst team, this is then handed off to the engineering team where they take this uh, production rule file, they then run their, perform their unit tests, and then the rule is uh, essentially deployed to production. So in closing, um, I kind of talked about a rule in the model rule trade-off and how it sort of feels like rule engines are kind of on one side and the statistical models on the other. And I hope that I kind of just kind of pushed you to rethink a little bit about how you can think about rule engines and in, in using arithmetic operations. <clears throat> and so I talked about specifically a domain name regex rule engine, how you can kind of use all these different character combinations and operators and expressions, and then uh, the binary tree algorithms. 
And then I talked about how like our team just worked on bootstrapping fishing coverage. Um, and then uh, talked about uh, a little bit about how we kind of deploy these things and work with uh, this rolling gym and the rule of life cycle, how we develop them and we have reviews.